I'm Eric Parker this morning on CT22. Sworn into office in January 2019, Governor Ned Lamont now hopes to win a second term. He and Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz are here to tell us why they think you should vote for them in November. And Connecticut gets a new top prosecutor. Chief State's Attorney Patrick Griffin will join us. Plus, state parks. What can you expect if you're planning to visit them this summer? The Deputy Commissioner of DEEP will join us in studio as well. It's all ahead. This final Sunday of May, CT22 starts right now. From WFSB, this is CT22 with Eric Parker, sponsored by Hartford Healthcare. Good morning. Thank you for watching. We begin our program today with Governor Ned Lamont and Lieutenant Governor Susan Beisowitz. They are seeking a second term to lead the state after a what can only be called a very unique first term. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for being with us here on CT22. Governor, I want to ask you about that. We saw this terrible tragedy in Texas this week, and it recalled for so many people the Sandy Hook shooting, which your predecessor, that was the big event, the big news event of his term. For you, it's been the COVID response, I think, without question, and those daily press conferences and, and coming into homes and trying to warn but also reassure. What do you think that did to affect your first term? It certainly uh, took us all by surprise. Uh, I remember that first day, um, like yesterday, where we got the call, went down to the hospital in Danbury, uh, that nurse, I could see uh, just the terror in people's eyes. I mean, we thought, okay, this is over in Wuhan. Oh my God, it's here in Connecticut. And uh, I think we found, um, you can't over communicate during a crisis like that. I didn't have all the answers, but I wanted people to know how I was thinking about how we keep ourselves safe and how we get our state open. And by thinking out loud, I think people were more likely to follow the lead. We have you both here because we're talking re-election. And, and one thing that political observers noticed was both your opponent and you started the election process early, ads on TV earlier than perhaps in a normal year. Why was it so important for you to get that message out early that you're running and, and why you're running? Well, there were... A lot of ads coming from my opponent for a couple of months there. I was sort of hoping to leave the politics till after the session, but um, with him up on TV, we thought it was important, Susan and I, that we get a very positive message out about why we think this state is on track and getting better every day. And uh, what is that pitch? What do you want people to know about your campaign? That we're just getting started. That uh, three years ago, there was a sense that Connecticut can't get its fiscal house in order. We're lurching from crisis to crisis, and jobs were leaving the state. And I'd like to think uh, we've turned that around. Susan and I, we got three straight years of surpluses, paying down pension, saving for a rainy day, and getting people back to work. First time in my life, I got 150,000 more jobs than I have people ready for them. This is a chance to lift everybody up and give them their chance. Lieutenant Governor, Be Governor Beiswitz, I want to turn to you. What is it? that now that you've had this uh, experience under your belt, what is it that a lieutenant governor can bring to a ticket? Why, what would you say to people about your role in this reelection? You know, look, we had two huge challenges facing us. One was a $2 billion deficit when we were sworn in. Uh, and also we had the COVID-19 crisis. So trust me, it took the two of us and the amazing partners we have in our commissioners, but also in our mayors and first selectmen and our legislators to handle this. Uh, I think the governor was very modest. He was a strong and very decisive leader during the pandemic, and it made our state one of the top vaccinated, best tested, and safest states in the country. And one of the reasons that um, our economy is so strong is we had 50,000 new families move to our state because it was safe. People rediscovered how beautiful it is. So uh, we've just begun. We've paid down $5.5 billion worth of debt. Um, as the governor pointed out, we just had a massive tax cut, the biggest in the history of our state, $600 million, three balanced budgets, major investments in infrastructure, mental health, child care. Um, we've done things that Republicans say they, that they like to do, and we've done them. I want to ask about that tax cut, Governor, because I think a lot of people who maybe just watch this stuff, they're, they're not day to day in politics. They, they read the headline. Maybe they read the article if it interests them. They hear something like a big tax cut package and say, oh, the politicians must be an election year. Well, it is an election year. And that was a big tax cut. So what do you say to people who say, oh, it's, it's just something to get some votes? Well, that was Susan and I. I mean, we've um, 
we're delivering on this tax cut. You're right. Every governor always says, I'm going to eliminate taxes. And then what happens when they come into office? Oh, my gosh, it's tougher than I thought it was going to be. But as Susan said, you know, inherited a $2 billion deficit. We got that um, balanced without any broad-based tax increases. Did that again and again and again. And now we have a surplus. And we're doing a $600 million plus middle-class tax cuts because people are getting slammed by inflation, doing everything I can to make this just a little more affordable. And let's not forget the gas tax cut of 25 cents a gallon. That's really key because with everything that's going on in the world, that's important as well. Exactly. Is there something that you think you've learned about governing during your time in office? Not necessarily about what policies you put in place, but, but being the boss. Is that something that, that you had to adapt to and learn from? A little bit. I mean, I've, I've generally been the boss of my own company. This is a very different game. But you have to earn people's respect every day. Like I said, when it came to COVID, thinking out loud, saying this is what we're doing, why we're doing it. You can't mandate everybody, follow me or else. That's not the way it worked. Some other states tried that, by the way. But Connecticut um, handled it well. We were able to keep our parks and beaches open, we keep our manufacturing open, keep our construction open. And we're able to do that safely, thanks to the people of Connecticut. And in addition to that, um, we made good on some of our campaign promises to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, which uplifts 170,000 families headed by women. Uh, we also have up and running the best paid family medical leave program in the country. It's helping 21,000 families a month. And we said we'd legalize marijuana and we've just put our state on a great path to do that. We had your opponents, uh, Bob Stefanowski and his running mate, Laura Devlin, on the show about a month ago. And I, I want to know what you would tell voters differentiates the two of you from the two of them. If somebody is, is looking for a couple of bullet points to say what would be different in the second Lamont administration mm -hmm. versus shifting gears to Stefanowski, what would you tell them? I tell them, for one, you know where we stand. And you know what we've done. And we know that we, um, you know, under promise and over deliver. I think you know where Susan and I stand, for example, on guns and the illegal ghost guns. And uh, Bob has been, let's say, on both sides of that issue, going back four years ago where he said he wanted to end all the um, Sandy Hook reforms we put in place. Same thing with choice. I think you know exactly where Susan and I are going to stand. We're going to veto anything that limits a woman's right to choose. You know, from the other side, there's, let's say, a little more ambiguity. That's got to make you nervous. Can I take that a step for, uh, further? I would just add to what the governor said is, you can trust us on women's reproductive health care. We just signed the Reproductive Freedom Act uh, a few weeks ago. That gives women the confidence that Connecticut will continue to be the safe harbor, not just for our state, but for women around the country. Um, we've said we support our Roe versus Wade law and our statutes, and Bob Stefanowski wants to introduce restrictions, and he hasn't said he will defend that law. Now, we have seen commercials, pro Stefanowski commercials, calling into question things like the school construction investigation, what's happened in West Haven with COVID money. No one is alleging, I don't think in any of those, that you personally did something, but you're the boss, like you said. What do you say to voters who've heard about those things and might be nervous about it? They were going right at it. As soon as I found out there may be some problems down in West Haven, um, we doubled down. The state has taken that over, giving everybody, every taxpayer confidence that money is being a well invested, honestly invested. You saw the same thing at OPM where we had a deputy and uh, that deputy is no longer with us. And Susan and I, integrity is number one. I've got to give everybody the confidence this money has been well invested and it's going to make an enormous difference in our state over the next five years. Well, as we said to get started, we started this campaign early, uh, both on the Democratic and Republican sides. We appreciate you coming in and uh, telling us a little bit about the campaign, and I'm sure we'll be talking to you again down the campaign trail. Thank you both for being nice with us. Thanks for having us.